tomorrow, go out and buy a blank journal and start keeping notes because you're going to meet all of these cool people in your life. And you're going to find things out about them. You're going to learn from them. You're going to get these pearls of wisdom. Write them down because if you just let them go, you'll forget them. And I did that. So I have 30 years worth of crossing paths with people like Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, John Chambers, uh, Andy Grove, Jeff Bezos, uh, Eric, Sergey, Larry from Google, so on and so forth. Um, and I have this, one of these days, I'm actually going to write a book. So what I chose to do for this presentation is I basically went through and I, and I pulled out what I thought were lessons in life that if I could go back and tell myself you know, leaving high school, what would I want to tell myself, right? And I know you have to hear it about 10 times. I've got a junior in high school and, you know, half of what I tell him, I, I know he doesn't hear, but, you know, anyway, hopefully some of these will stick. All right. I'm an engineer. I can do a chart. Okay. So you leave high school, college, right? This is your perception of your life, right? Everything's up and to the right, whether it's career, happiness, money, whatever, right? I hate to break it to you, but life doesn't work that way. Um, you know, I've, I've quit jobs. I've been fired from a job. Um, you know, I've had illness in the family. I've had deaths in the family. Stuff happens, right? And, you know, reflecting on that, it's all of these things, the adversity that you go through that makes you resilient. And these, the, it's, you know, if life were easy, you'd never grow. And it, I've realized in retrospect that all of these dips, all these adversities that I went through, those were the things that shaped me who I am today, made me resilient. Those were the things, the life lessons that I pulled away. And just to re remember, it's all about the trend line too, right? There's a wonderful book called Grit, G-R-I-T. And Grit actually spells this out. It's probably one of the best books in terms of resiliency, and I encourage all of you to read it. All right, so I'll, I'll leave that up there. I was at Amazon.com um, because people always ask me, they're like, oh my gosh, you were at Amazon during the early days. How did you plan that out? And I tell them, you won't believe the story. I was, in 1996, I was living in Phoenix, Arizona. I was working at Intel. And I was 32. Um, I was running a large plant for Intel. I had about a third of Intel's revenue going through my plant. I had about 1,000 people working for me. And, you know, I looked at my life and career, and, and it looked pretty good, right? Um, and, I, and if had I stayed at Intel, I probably would have had a good career. But something was nagging at me, right? I had no debt. My wife and I had just gotten married, so we didn't have kids yet. I wonder what it would be like to go to a startup. And, and what would that be like, right? So I called my father. Now, my father spent 36 years at IBM. And I said, hey, Dad, I'm thinking of leaving Intel to go join a startup. And he, said, he looked at me and said, what are you, nuts? I mean, what are you thinking? And I realized that his whole risk tolerance was, and his worldview was completely different from mine, right? I mean, he looked at, you know, and his you know, his, in his day and age, it was all about going to one company and, and staying there. Um, anyway, I, I got some other people's advice, and I still wanted to go down the startup route, right? So I put some feelers out through, through my network, and lo and behold, uh, I got this opportunity to go to Seattle and, and work for Bill Gates uh, for a startup that, that he had. It wasn't Microsoft. Um, and, you know, I'm an engineer, so, you know, I'm, I've got, first thing I do is pull out Excel, but the pros, the cons of going to Seattle, the pros, the cons of staying in, at Intel in Phoenix. My wife is not an engineer. In fact, I lovingly call her the anti-quant, right? And she said, hey, you know, there's no amount of spreadsheets in the world that are going to help you answer this question. So let's go off to Cancun, and, and we're going to make our decision in Cancun. So we go to Cancun, and we are... Um, we're down there Saturday night. We're leaving on Sunday morning. And I was over 21, so, you know, this is probably not great role modeling. But anyway, we couldn't make up our mind. And I said, dear, I have no idea how to make this, this decision. And she came back with two shots of tequila and a quarter and said, flip the quarter. 
Heads Phoenix, tails Seattle. And it was tails, and that's how we ended up in, in Seattle. So, I find myself now working at the startup in Seattle. It's Bill Gates, right? How can it be wrong? It was a disaster. I mean, you know, we, we had more money than we knew what to do with. That was probably part of the problem, by the way. Um, but we didn't have a business plan that actually closed, and there were all kinds of squabbling, and that's a story for another day. And uh, I was miserable. I came home one day and, and said, I, I, I've had it. I don't think I can go into work another day. My wife looked at me and said, guess what? I'm pregnant. So, you know, now I'm sitting here going, okay, I mean, you know, the worst day of your life and maybe the best day of your life all wrapped up into one. Two weeks later, a friend of mine called me and said, hey, you were at Intel, right? Do you know anything about, like, operations? And I said, yeah, I know a fair amount about operations. And he said, hey, I met this guy who's selling books on the Internet. You should meet him. And I said, okay, what's the guy's name? And he said, Jeff Bezos. I said, okay, never heard of the guy, but yeah, sure, I'll, I'll meet this guy. Uh, so I met Jeff. Actually, at the time, Amazon was in the back of a methadone clinic. And, uh, it, you know, it was completely, I went there and I told my wife, I'm going to do this for a few years because there's probably a 50-50 chance that this thing's going to go out of business anyway and I'll be looking for another job. And, uh, and, and that had a pretty profound impact on, on my life. So... Uh, it just goes to show you that you don't, uh, things aren't as they appear and life is not uncertain or certain. All right. So I hope you've heard this. I'm going to say this probably the hundredth time. We live in a bubble, right? Um, there is untold wealth in, in Silicon Valley and, and we live in this, you know, even compared to the rest of the country, I, I, part of the, one of the cool things about my job is I travel all over the world. Uh, you know, I travel to China and, and uh, India a lot. And the thing that, that I try to remind my son, and I actually take him to these places, is, um, you know, the most, the, the person who's got the least wealth in, in the United States lives better than the vast majority of the world. You're not going to find security. Money buys you security and it buys you options, Right but it'll never buy you happiness. I know a ton of people around Silicon Valley that have done really well financially, and I will tell you, I have an equal set of billionaires and, and you know, gazillionaires that are miserable and that are happy. And, you know, so I've done an informal poll and I said, you know, what, what makes people happy coming to work every day, right? Or, or happy in their life. And it's that they've got purpose, you know? So, they actually wake up every day and they, they don't have a job. They actually have a purpose. They're going to work and doing what they love to do. And one thing that I, I tell my son is, you know, because he asked me, you know, so what's your definition of success? And I, I've said, it's easy. It's finding what you love to do and doing it really well. And if you, and if you find your passion and you wake up every day and that's what you want to do, that's awesome. That, that's success right there, right? And, you know, life is not about money, but there's a high correlation to success and people doing what they really love to do. I work for one of Google's founders. This guy's name is Urs Hutzli. He's a Swiss guy. Um, you've probably never heard of him. He's kind of an icon in the cloud world. Uh, Urs is employee number eight. And I would venture to say that if you're employee number eight at Google, you don't need to work. And I went into Orz's office a few years ago, and I, and I have, you know, through Jesuit education and a German upbringing, I have a decent work ethic. Orz works harder than anybody I've ever seen. And I asked Orz one day, and I, I said, Orz, you know, why, how do you work like this? I mean, you know, you're in here all the time. You're sending me emails at all crazy hours. You're always thinking about this place. And he looked at me and said, this is not a job. This is what I wake up and I love to do every day. And he said, why do you come here? And I said, you know, pretty much for the same reason you do. I mean, I get to go to work every day and work with some of the most talented, smartest, driven people in the world. And fortunately, most of them have very low egos. So it's a fun place to work. We're not trying to kill each other. All right. You're all going to love, anybody that's a student right now is going to love to hear this. You're all thinking about 
hey, I'm going to graduate from this place and I'm done, right? Or I'm going to go to school and once I get my BS degree or my master's or whatever, I'm done. I hate to break it to you. Everything that you're learning, particularly if you learn in technology, is obsolete in at best 10 years. So you're actually just learning, going to school to learn how to learn. All the jobs that I've had since Intel didn't exist when I was at MIT. There was no dot-com industry. You know, Google didn't exist. You know, who would have thought that, you know, a company selling ads on a search bar could generate $80 billion a year, right? I mean, those jobs didn't exist. So, you know, I'm an aerospace engineer, but I've got to tell you, I do nothing today that looks anything like aerospace engineering, but it had to relearn everything multiple times because that's just the nature of technology. And I would argue that technology is impacting every piece of the economy today. So you can't run away from it. And I think you guys uh, know that better than I do. Humility goes a long way. There's a high correlation to the most successful people to being the lowest ego people. One of my favorite stories is I was having dinner with Neil Armstrong one night. And I asked Neil a question that I suspect he's probably been asked 100,000 times. Neil, what did it feel like to walk on the moon? What did it feel like to be the first guy to walk on the moon? And I said, you know, Neil, you, know, you are like the modern day Christopher Columbus. And he looked at me completely deadpan and said, I was doing my job. There were 400,000 people, engineers and clerks, technicians, manufacturing people, they, they, they were the, one who, the ones who got me to the moon and got me back safely. I knew the risks. I was a test pilot and I was just doing my job. And I'm sitting here going, okay, I've got to be honest. I, I'm a fairly humble guy. If I was the first man to walk on the moon, I don't think I'd be that humble. But it was this amazing, you know, I was completely blown away by the fact that here's this guy who's completely unimpressed with probably one of the most historic feats in the last hundred years. Amazing. Um, my favorite definition of leadership is finding people who are better than you, smarter than you, but actually want to follow you somewhere. Uh, and again, you know, there's a corollary to that, which is when you go out and shape your life, surround, your surround yourself with friends that are actually better than you are. Case in point, I, I got a call from a friend of mine who's the CEO of a big company in, in, in St. Louis and uh, uh, yesterday, and he said, hey, I'm struggling with this particular problem. I, I, I can't go into a lot of detail on it. He said, I just want your perspective on it. And, you know, it takes a lot for the, for the CEO of a Fortune 500 public company to call somebody up and say, I need help because I can't figure this out on my own. And I thought that was an amazing, uh, amazing thing. Okay. Um, back to your friends. Find great friends and they will help you never stray from your ethics and your morals. I have seen a number of careers uh, that were destroyed uh, because people, they got away from the things that were most important. Whenever I go to a job or whenever I take on a task, the first thing that I do is I, I write down, what do I want my legacy to be, right? When I leave Google, what are the two, three things that I want to leave behind that when I come back in 10 years, I will have changed something indelible about that company? And I start working on that day one. And I've always treated um, life like that. And, I, and another, it was a great piece of advice that, uh, that Andy Rowe gave me. And finally, for you kids out there, um, I would tell you, thank your parents. You know, I'm, I'm the first kid in my family to have ever gone to college. And I don't think I appreciated that my sister went to Notre Dame. Um, and and uh, we had actually two kids simultaneously. My father had two kids simultaneously in college. And I don't think I ever appreciated until just a few years ago the sacrifices that, that, that he made and my family made. Um, but he didn't go to college. And he, he knew the importance of going to college. And I now respect the sacrifices that, that he made uh, so that my sister and I could go to college. And that was, candidly, that, that is you know, the, the, the thing that made all the difference. Going to great schools, 
and uh, being able to apply that knowledge. So I'll leave that with you guys. I know we didn't talk tech, but anyway, uh, hopefully you, you enjoy it. Thanks.